You're listening to The Profile. Hello and welcome to The Profile podcast. I'm Andy Peck. For the past 17 years, I've been interviewing leaders in the church and the wider culture. In the coming weeks, you'll be hearing the best of these conversations, plus some brand new ones as well. It was leadership expert John Maxwell who famously said, leadership is influence. Some have massive influence through their role as a leader of a church or business, a charity or a family. Others have influence in their neighbourhood, a network of friends or through leisure interests. It's our prayer that these conversations will help you in whatever spheres you have influence. This show is brought to you by Premier Christianity magazine, the UK's leading Christian magazine. Get full online access and the print magazine every month by becoming a subscriber. See special offers available now at premierchristianity.com. Many church leaders start out in pastoral ministry and then maybe become writers during their ministry or perhaps when they retire. But my guest today started off in journalism, writing and editing, and then came to pastoral ministry relatively late. His name is Dave Roberts, and many of you may know him through his journalism or his books. He was the one-time editor of Premier Christianity in a former incarnation when it was called Alpha. Uh, His books include The Grace Outpouring and The Way of Blessing, uh, written with Roy Godwin, and Red Moon Rising with Pete Gregg, as well as being the sole author of The Toronto Blessing in 1984. He's had also a senior role in publishing with Kingsway. And today he's the pastor of the Gather Collective in Eastbourne. And he's been doing that since 2010. So, Dave, lovely to welcome you to the Leadership Show. Thank you. Appreciate Uh, being with you. No, it's great great to have you along. Um, So, as I said, you entered pastoral ministry after a lifelong time writing and um, reflecting on things about God and the church. Uh, What was the spur to do that i think there was a couple of things one the atmosphere that uh, i was working in even with the magazines and later on in christian publishing uh was enriched if i had a strong view of what local church life was actually like yeah um you know with uh, uh, one of the magazines i edited back in the day for uh the, the founding entity behind what is now Christianity today, uh, back then was at Elm House. I um, I edited the leadership magazine, um, which is called Today. It started in 1955 uh, in the aftermath of the Billy Graham uh, visit oh, right, to yes. the UK. I remember, yeah. And, and uh, I, um, I was on the eldership, shall we say, um, in a, a local church. Um, uh, and remained in, engaged with them in various ways until 1994, uh, about two years before I left Elm House. Um, but, you know, it's one thing to be a group of five or six people helping direct the church. It's another thing to be the, the person who's kind of the lead elder, so to speak. And that doesn't imply hierarchy necessarily. It just implies somebody has to pick up the threads and chair the meetings and Sure. Um, you know, do what needs to be done. And so uh, I think the thing that, that was kind of hung around in my mind and which may be of interest to your listeners is um, it's fairly easy to do the, the basics, you know, get a Sunday right, uh, healthy midweek meetings. But I've always been worrying around, if you see what I mean, uh, personal discipleship. How do we help people grow and mature um, in their understanding of Jesus and his work um, and, and just be healthy healthy members of our congregations who can pass on uh, their wisdom to others. So um, I, it's only in recent years uh, that I've been kind of like the lead elder, so to speak, um, um, and that is a transition. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I've been in church leadership pretty much for 40 years now uh, in various forms. I think the reason for another church plant in Eastbourne um, 
if I'm really honest, and I'm, and I'm sure your readers will appreciate, uh, your listeners will appreciate honestly, um, we're a town where a very large church has absorbed a great deal of the, um, the people, basically. Um, and the wave of churches that was established in the 1980s as part of the renewal movement that took place, charismatic renewal movement, uh, had planted many churches, often in community centres, um, and they were then given the responsibility for the community centre because they were a good client, they paid their bills, they left the place tidy, um, and, uh, and many of those churches, 30 years on, were beginning to come to the end of themselves because they'd lost a generation of 18 to 30, 40 somethings to a, a large church in the town. Um, and uh, several of us have wanted to join the Pioneer Network, uh, which held a slightly different theological stance to this picture. Um, and so we decided to begin to explore that. Um, so there's a positive side to what we're doing in as much as we'd like to plant a life giving church within walking distance of every person in each one. And that some of the existing uh, churches in the evangelical or charismatic traditions would fit that bill. So it's not as if everything is starting from scratch, uh, but there are significant areas around the town where um, there isn't a life giving church within walking distance. Uh, we have a, a, a definition of life giving um, that relates to uh, openness to the gifts of the spirit um, uh, and some other theological points that, that stop some people even coming in the door. Uh, we believe very positively in the role of women uh, at every level of our congregation, uh, from preaching uh, right through to being in the leadership team, and we believe that's the biblical pattern. So sometimes you have to start a church because there isn't one congregation in town that would sit within that framework, although there are several that you might have a good deal of agreement with and fellowship with. Sure. Um, and, and I'm, you know, I'm 66. I, I didn't want to spend the next 10 years fiddling around on the edge of a church where I didn't agree with what they were saying for so, um, you know, one last adventure, as they say. Oh, well done. No, good for you. Um, and uh, obviously you are a charismatic evangelical church, so you believe the the basic tenets of, of Christian faith, but you also uh, have one of some of your themes include creation care, uh, fair trade, anti-racism, as well as you've mentioned the full equality of women in church life. Um, you've You've... Uh, mentioned uh, women in church life. Would you like to mention some of those others that are maybe how that works out in terms of your practice? Yeah, we, um, I'm reading a lot of missional literature at the moment, uh, from some of the giants, you know, um, uh, Christopher Wright, um, uh, Donald Blush, Transformation of Mission, that kind of sort of book that you read slowly over several weeks, hard books. And one of the things that they say is that um, part of our mandate on earth is to love God, love our neighbor, love ourselves, and love the creation that God created, um, uh, embracing the Hebrew worldview that says it might be marred, but it's God's, um, uh, as opposed to a Greek worldview that says it's a mess, forget about it, you're going to go up somewhere eventually and just sing a lot and, you know, Whereas Revelation seems to suggest there might be a new heaven and a new earth. So we're pursuing uh, creation care fairly vigorously. In, and, and, in, and in that, you have conversation partners like Tia Fund and Russia and so on, who are looking to be thoroughly biblical in their pursuit of these things. For us, practically, that means auditing our activities to make sure that we're, you know, that we're on the case with creation care climate change, all those kind of things. But also, very practically, we were growing our own food for the community meal that we were doing. And um, it was a large plot that had been managed by um, 
or name and locality. You've got to be used for charitable purposes. Um, but we didn't have his horticultural gifting, but he didn't have our community uh, skills, basically, in terms of our previous experience in having run a community centre. So th those two things combined uh, mean that we're the only community garden in Eastbourne that's open six days a week. Um, and uh, we get a lot of interest, uh, both from Christians, but also from people who are not yet Christians. And um, and so we, uh, we're probably 120 people coming through the gate every week. Um, and we believe that will rise to 200, 240 over the next year or so. Um, there is a congregation that started already uh, on the community garden plot, um, which is a kind of a group of not yet Christians in the main, exploring what faith means. Um, uh, but we would anticipate that some will join that and others might join our more conventional congregation, which is about 300 yards away. Um, so if people in the locality are touched by what we're doing, they've got two physical points of contact straight away uh, to explore faith more. Um, uh, because of our work uh, to do with uh, racism um, and some of those other issues, we also have got significant contact with um, uh, groups that are campaigning in those areas throughout the town. And if I was honest, um, uh, not many churches know who they are or would even talk to them because many churches in any given town um, are, are quite right wing really and they, they don't want to be seen associating with left wing people but um, uh, I've been encouraged to think of the possibility of doing a human's funeral for one communist lady um, um, and uh, and people say, well, Dave, even this funeral, what use is that? Uh, well, it's just, I'll tell you what it is. It's a start. Um, uh, a, a lot of people from the, the sort of the center of politics and the left don't have much contact with uh, Christians um, who will have a coherent conversation about life, poverty, all those kind of things. So we're trying to be uh, uh, winsomely prophetic both the little church in the town and also the wider civic society. Um, and so, yeah, that's how, that's how we're making it concrete. We do the PA for the demos about racism. We do. Uh, I was actually invited to speak at the COP26 event in the town. And uh, so I spoke without mentioning the reference from uh, 1 Corinthians 13 and said, you know, what are the great documents of uh, ancient wisdom that talk about love? And what is the quality of love? So if you love creation, if you love the world, if you love this planet we live on, you're going to have to be patient. And so I went through the whole thing. And of course, some of the crowd got the clue. And some of them just thought it was a very nice speech. <laughs> yes. So, I, uh, yes. Well, so, yeah. Uh, good to hear. I, I recall... Um... John Maxwell preaching on leadership, uh, basically from the Bible, but not using that language. And people saying, that oh, was really good. Where did it come from? <laughs> and he said, you don't want to know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So that's, that's fabulous to hear, uh, Dave. Um, and I'm just interested, You, you uh, many years ago, you wrote uh, about the Toronto Blessing in, in a very positive fashion, of course. Um, and uh, since then, there have been other, in quotes, revivals and moves of God. Um, and more recently, the Asbury revival um, in uh, the uh, uh, southern part of the United States. Um, what would you? What would you? What wisdom would you give about your reflections on revival over time, and 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 how Christians have typically viewed them and um, uh, interacted with them? Should we say? Yeah. Well, one of the things that uh, helped inform me when I was writing about Toronto was uh, six or seven books that I bought in the Faith Mission Bible uh, uh, showroom in Belfast about revival, and particularly with reference to revival in Northern Ireland, which is where my family background is. 
And one of the things that we uh, I discerned from that was that in the 1857 revival, a lot of the senior clergy um, uh, were involved in the meetings in the botanic gardens. Amazing things were happening. But some of them were deputized to stand near the back um, and uh, deal with not so much people heckling, but as uh, putting on spiritual sideshows, uh, so to speak, um, and actually conning gullible people. Um, and so I think there's always going to be that note in any appraisal of revival. Um, when you look at what happened in Toronto, there was a significant uh, um, reinforcement of themes that Floyd McClung had been pursuing about the Father Heart of God, knowing that we are loved. Um, the Pensacola revival that followed was of a slightly different character, but uh, two of the key figures in that had only come back from Toronto a few days before their one broke out. But it was deeply affected by strains of teaching to do with Leonard Ravenhill um, uh, and some of those classic holiness creatures from the past. Um, and then the specific Pentecostalism that, that Brownsville was, was all about. But if you're going to hold the discernment thing up, as well as the, you know, don't shy away from that which is slightly unusual and a little bit different, um, you would then have to look at what happened with Todd Bentley and say, uh, why did everyone go to sleep? If he was carried on with somebody in the middle of the quote, revival. Um, and uh, a leading American journalist said to me, Dave, this is the problem with the church today. Uh, there are a lot of people who are word and spirit people who will always take the scripture and not say, um, I need a mandate for everything that happens from a specific verse, but say, what's the character of this revival? What is the outcomes in people's lives? How does that match up the script? And then you you would then begin to reflect. Somebody else in the, in the late 80s, early 90s talked about how did, did we want a spectacular three-week revival or did we want a Wesleyan reignition of spirituality uh, amongst uh, the ordinary men and women? Uh, there was only 30,000 men when he died, there was a million a hundred years later, he had planted a seed of something. If you bring it right up to the present day, um, and you look at Asbury, somebody wrote a piece the other day, I can't remember the exact details, but I think they were from quite close in to the centre, and they're uh, holding at arm's length the celebrities and the glory chasers and me, and I sing a few songs because they'll go around the world and sing the glory of idol kind of people. Um, uh, and then wrote a piece basically saying, we believe in a God who does things suddenly and also slowly but surely. Now, in classic uh, theological, even just the leader terms, they believe in those moments when the Holy Spirit comes, like the Advent, and they believe in what many call progressive sanctification. Um, and for a revival group to be sticking their hand up and saying that in the middle of the revival, actually suggests to me a significant maturity uh, of approach um, because these things are always haunted on the fringes by um, ecstatic people who would brook no contradiction. Um, and so they won't let you measure anything they do against the Word of God. They won't let you discern it uh, in that way um, or even common sense. Um, and many people are taken in by them. You know, oh, brother, such and such. You know, but I don't think brother such and such is reading the Bible. Oh, no, you can't say that about him. He's got such a good ministry. No. What is he talking about? You know, show me the biblical pattern. And so I continue to hold positively a belief that God does come in the Bible power. Um, and also, what I hope has always been my stance, which is, uh, and let's just reflect. Of what the outcomes are, what the fruit is, you know. Um, you know, I can handle a bit of eccentricity and a bit of wild stuff, but there comes a point where you have to stick around up and say, and? <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. <laughs> Dave, you've and been the a... the fruit of the spirit. 
Indeed, indeed. Um, uh, Dave, it would be remiss of me not to ask you for some book recommendations, given your lifetime in journalism and writing and editing. Um, have there been particular books that have, have, have helped you, particularly in your understanding of leadership? Yeah, I read a book a very long time ago called The Dynamics of Spiritual Renewal by Richard Lovelace. Oh, yes. And um, it profoundly impacted me. Um, and I found in conversation with people that it impacted a lot of other leaders. Um, chapter 7 was very helpful for me in my own personal spiritual walk. Um, I also read a book called Re Jesus by Alan Hirsch and it might be Michael Frost. Yes. Um, they often write together. And he basically said, we need to sort things out here. We've lost sight of Jesus. Mm. We're good at the Old Testament. We're good at the um, epistles. But we skip over Jesus all the time. And um, and then in all of that mix, you would find theologians like Scott McKnight. Um, and Scott wrote a book called A Community Called Atonement, um, in which he talks about the communal nature of everything that happens to us spiritually and how we can become a, a community that brings atonement. Um, uh, he also wrote Jesus' Creed and Kingdom Conspiracy, all of which are, are looking at uh, Western individualized evangelicalism and questioning whether we're missing something. Um, as he and others have pointed out, the Creed says that Jesus was born and then within seconds it says only died. Yes. But actually, the nub of Everything that we need to know is in the, the four books that yes. describe when he was around. And many churches reduce them to trite moralism, truth be told. Um, you know, uh, the two brothers, one who said, oh, I'm going to help your dad, and the other one said he wouldn't. And then the one who said he wouldn't turned up, and the, yeah. the one who said he would didn't. And I, I've heard it preached as, keep your word, you know, be a trustworthy person. It's not that at all. Jesus is giving the Pharisees a hard time for wishing for a Messiah. Well, not even the Pharisees, the temple authorities, for wishing for a Messiah, but not, turn, not turning up when he comes. Uh, and then the ordinary Jewish people, of, all, of some faith or none, uh, are clamoring after Jesus, but he's telling them something they didn't know and didn't understand, and he's loving them in a way so nobody else loved them. So, so, so in that sense, it's almost like you would have reading mentors, and, and I would look upon uh, Scott McKnight and Hersh and Frost, uh, Lovelace, uh, I'm reading Donald Blush's book, Transform the Mission at the moment, and I'm just underlining it so much. Good. Well, yeah. that's, well thank you for the recommendation, and uh, yeah, uh, obviously, we, I mentioned your books at the start of the um uh, the show, The Grace Outpouring, The Way of Blessing with Roy Godwin and The Red Moon Rising with Pete Gregg. And, of course, Pete himself has gone on to write other books himself. So, um, Yeah, yeah, he didn't, he didn't actually need me for that book, but he thought he did. So, <laughs> oh, you're um, very gracious. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, he, he's one of the most gifted uh, Christian writers of his generation. In fact, probably the last 50 years, he has a way with words and eloquence Um uh, that leaves its mark. And Red Moon has gone to over 90 countries now. And it's what you would call a fast starter book. People read it and then they do it, you know. Um, and uh, Grace Outpouring is similar, uh, uh, albeit maybe even fractionally more sales. Um, but a lot of people, uh, it's interesting. Uh, being from an evangelical background, I would always thought, you know, if you read a book, it affects your mind. When it's affected, the mind affects the whole being, you know. Uh, but a very kind of cognitive, intellectual way of looking at what a book was. And one of the things we discovered, Grace Outpouring and also Red Moon, was that people cried and cried while they were reading it. And there was clearly a Holy Spirit thing going on between what we'd written, what they were reading, and what God was doing at that precise moment in their lives. And... Um, so you hope that you can always be writing those books where people meet with God while they're reading it, not just as part of an intellectual progression, you know. So, yeah, yeah, it's – books are a wonderful thing. Not everybody, you know, 
Don't still work for everybody. That you work for me. Oh, oh that's well. Well, great to hear, Dave, and um, uh, thank you for spending some time with us, sharing a little bit about your uh, vision for uh, life in a church in in Eastbourne, and also reflecting with us on on what God is and has been doing. And um, you know, bless you for your lifetime of ministry in this in this field and helping others to connect with with the Lord. So much appreciated. That's great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good to speak to you. Again. That was my interview with Dave Roberts, the pastor of the Gathering Collective in Eastbourne. If you're a reader, then do check out the books that he mentioned, uh, those by uh, Scott McKnight, including uh, The Jesus Creed. Uh, he mentioned Richard Lovelace, Dynamics of Spiritual Renewal, one that I read uh, many decades ago and would be well worth uh, digging out and finding, perhaps in um, an old bookshop or online. Uh, the Grace Outpouring and the Way of Blessing are books that Dave uh, Roberts wrote with Roy Godwin, uh, looking particularly at God's work in Feldy Brennan in Wales. And um, Red Moon Rising is a book he wrote with uh, Pete Gregg. So this is Andy Peck thanking you for your company and looking forward to the next time. Bye for now. You've been listening to The Profile in association with Premier Christianity magazine.